So, hello, let's go. I'm Rebecca, I am from CERN and Imperial College London. But I'd like to say today that everything I'm gonna say is my own opinions, I'm gonna try and be as honest as possible, uh, and these do not express the opinions of the people who I work for. Uh, now, I'm very excited to be talking about particle accelerators. I think this is a technology that is very overrated and underrated at the same time, and I'm gonna try and demonstrate this Inspiration from Thomas. Who here has heard of the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC? Uh, raise your hand. Good amount of people. Uh, who here can name literally any other accelerator? OK, well, there are. <laughs> I'm curious if you can. I think there's one in America, like Michigan or something. Do you know its name? No. OK. <laughs> There are 32,000 accelerators in the world, guys. Uh, so we've got some explaining to do about what these machines are doing. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with a quote. Uh, when Dagny Taggart is riding the John Galt line and she feels that thrill of experience, she throws open the engine and she says, why had she always felt that joyous sense of confidence when looking at machines? Every part of the machine was an embodiment to why and what for. These machines are the physical shape of a mind that has been able to grasp the whole of the complexity of this machine to set its purpose. So that's what I'll be talking about today. I'm going to be saying what an accelerator is, but why and what for. And accelerators are great because why and what for are two different answers. Unlike most things in life, why and what for is the same answer. And then I'm going to go a little bit into flourishing for whom. I mean, it's academia, it's government. It's a little bit controversial, right? So uh, let's actually just dive straight into it. How do accelerators enhance human flourishing? Uh, we're just going to immediately answer that question. <coughs> Particle accelerators can shrink tumors. They can be used for imaging, for all security appliances. They can be used to clean up the environment, clean up dirty fuels. They're used to map 3D structures of any biological structure, such as proteins. They are used in every single manufacturing of every single semiconductor. They are used for diagnosing diseases and loads of medical imaging. We use them to scour for minerals, for oils, for things we can't see under the surface. We use them to break down nuclear waste from long form into short decaying so that they're not affecting their environment as much. We use them in drug design. We use them to test arts to see if they're fraudulent or not. But we use them to discover the secrets of our universe. It's a machine. It accelerates, hence its name, charged particles, and it does this to high energies using electric or magnetic fields. And the image here is of the 1932 invention of the Cockcroft Walton accelerator, uh, looking very nice and shiny in the background. Let's break down this definition a bit. When I say charged particle, what do I mean? We have atoms, right? You guys are somewhat familiar with atoms. Uh, in the center of the atom, we have a positively charged particle called the proton, and orbiting around it is the negatively charged particle called the electron. And these are pretty much the two particles we accelerate most of the time. Uh, now, in the middle of the atom, it's not just protons, but also neutrons. And if you have more of them, it can be an ion. So an ion is a charged atom. Uh, and finally, we have a particle called a muon. This is a heavy electron. Basically, So these are the only particles I'm going to be referring to today. All you need to know is that they have something called charge. This charge allows them to interact with electric fields and magnetic fields. An electric field is just a voltage difference. You know, if like a battery, you have a positive voltage and negative voltage, that produces a force. This force affects charged particles. And magnetic fields, you can imagine your horseshoe magnet has a north, it has a south, this creates a force, and generally you can say we use electric fields to accelerate and magnetic fields to bend and control. It's not quite as obvious as that, but 
I'll let you know this is what accelerators are made up of, these two things. Now, that was such a broad definition, but there are loads of different types of accelerators. Anything you do with electromagnets and charged particles is an accelerator. So you can put them in a circle, you can line them up in a ring, you can put them in a line, and each of these is for a different particle type, a different energy, and a different intensity. Now when I say a beam, this is just a bunch of particles together, a, a lot of them. Uh, and these are mostly like squished in space so we can control them. Um, now particles in a circle are made up of these two halves, our north half and our south half. And each time the particle goes round, these switch between north and south so that it keeps orbiting in a circle. Now, this is called a cyclotron. You don't need to remember the name. Uh, these are great for heavy particles. They don't really work for light particles like electrons. But at large energies, they fill a room. They're huge. So we can't really use these for high energies. We can put our particles in a ring. This is called a synchrotron. And these have a series of magnets. Some of them bend, some of them focus. Uh, and these, we can just keep making them bigger. Uh, and so these are used for extremely high energies, the highest in the world. Uh, and finally, we can put them in a line. This is called a linear accelerator or a LINAC. And these use an electric field which oscillates, uh, which is an alternating field. Uh, and you can do high energies, but then it has to be really long, like kilometers long. So they're best for small energies. So that was a kind of brief introduction of what kind of accelerators we can have. But the thing is with innovation and accelerators is it's not about the accelerator. It's not about the beam. So here you have an example of a beam line. And in red is the beam going through it, and this magnet bends, and this magnet focuses. It doesn't really matter. Supporting this structure is a whole host <laughs> of different technologies, right? So you have your Magnets, of course, these control the particle. But we have superconductors. If you've heard of superconductors, these are materials that when you cool them to extremely low temperatures, all of the resistance vanishes. And they make incredibly good um, electric circuits. And so you can use these for maglev trains, uh, levitating trains, uh, for example. And the entire industry of superconductors came because we used so many goddamn magnets in our machine. Uh, but if you want to have superconductors, you've got to make your beam cold, so cold. To do this, we use liquid nitrogen and then liquid helium, so much helium. And that requires our entire system to be cooled. So the field of cryogenics is propped up by these needs from accelerators. Now, our beam can't pass through air like this. If it does, it will hit gas molecules, and it will scatter, and it blows up, and then we lose all our nice properties. So we get rid of all the air. We pump it out with a vacuum. And so again, so much of the vacuum systems that are now used in industry are motivated from accelerators. Um, you also have to power every single magnet to as high as they can go with very high voltages, high voltage power supplies. But also, we're kind of blind because we've got all of these systems. You want to see the beam. You want to see what it's doing. Otherwise, you don't know where it is. You don't know anything about it. And so we have instrumentation and monitors, a revolutionary new field just to, be, just to say, how can we detect this? but not destroy it, just detect it passively as it goes by. That's a challenge in itself. Um, and then finally, if it does hit any materials, these high particles, they're going to scatter. They're going to go everywhere. And you want engineers to go down to service all of this technology, so you've got to have radiation shielding, which is useful everywhere in space. You know, When we build our Mars colony, we're going to need to shield our colony from all this radiation. And then, finally, all of the nerds in the control room are going to have to do something with this beam. 
So control systems are a very unique thing that have built up in order to monitor, control these power supplies, and control the entire system. Uh, so you can imagine that this entire thing has trained a lot of people using a lot of technologies that is extremely <coughs> transferable and created an industry around it. This is more than just the accelerator. So if we do all this hard work to make accelerators, why? Why do we do this? Particle accelerators are our door to access the subatomic world, the smallest scales of the universe. We use it to study atoms, study particles, and its components. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, in nuclear physics, uh, I mentioned we have the nucleus inside the atom. We use these high energy particles to break bits of the nucleus apart and change what the atom is. So, you know, the dream of the ancient alchemists, let's make gold from lead. We can do that now. We do that all the time. We're constantly smashing atoms and breaking them apart. Uh, and then in particle physics, the energy that goes into the particles is used to make new matter from nothing, seemingly. This is the relation that energy is equal to matter. That means when we have high energy particles and they collide, it makes mass. That's what Einstein's famous E equals MC squared means. Uh, now, during the panel, I wanted to introduce the concept of curiosity. This is something that's really important when it comes to something as seemingly initially useless as particle accelerators, is that there is value and merit in research for the art of curiosity alone. And it has produced extraordinary discoveries, some of which we talked about in our panel. But I'd like to highlight a few of my favorite examples. Whenever J.J. Thompson would give a speech in the 1900s, he would raise a toast and he would say to the electron, may it never be of use to anyone. The electron is, of course, the foundation of all electronic appliances and the basis of all semiconductors and the modern world. The electron came from a guy who found something weird and was like, that's pretty cool. What causes that? There's a particle called a neutrino. It passes through the world. There are millions of you passing through every second. They interact very, very weakly. They barely interact at all. When they were postulated, uh, Pauli, who, who postulated them, said, I've done a terrible thing. I have postulated a particle that cannot be detected. It was detected 26 years later and is now used in imaging of the universe, of the sun, and of nuclear reactors. So we can see if there are any illicit nuclear reactors being performed that we don't know about because we detect the neutrinos coming out of them. And my favorite particle ever is the muon. A Nobel Prize winner, Isidore Rabbi, when it was discovered, said, who ordered that? Came from nowhere. I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. But if you need any more convincing that these things are of value, 25 Nobel Prizes in physics have had direct contributions from accelerators. Many, many more Nobel Prizes have had indirect contributions from accelerators, including in medicine and in chemistry. These truly are engines of discovery. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about the early accelerators, which happens to correlate with the UK. I say the UK because that's where we are at the moment. Uh, the race for accelerators started in 1911 with the Cavendish Laboratory's gold foil experiment. Rutherford fired some helium particles at a gold foil, and he found that a very, very small proportion of them recoiled perfectly back, like 180 degree would recoil back. That's kind of like throwing a bowling ball at some tissue paper and having it hit you back in the face. Like, that's how bizarre this, this fact is. 
And so that made him realize there's something very dense and very charged in the center of the atom. And that was when we discovered the nucleus. And when that happens, people are like, well, we've got to find out more about them, surely. So the very first particle accelerator was in 1932. I mentioned the Cockcroft Walton. Uh, and they split the atom for the first time with this machine in Cambridge, in Cavendish Laboratory. Uh, this was the machine. And they needed to image the particles. So what happened is that um, Cockcroft, who was a very tall guy, had to sit in this box with a black curtain around it and stare at the patterns on the, uh, on the screen. You know, in fact, Cavendish Laboratory actually had a, a, a constant rotation of students <coughs> who were used to the dark. So when one student's eye got sore, they left, and they had a student who'd already been in a dark room to focus their eyesight to go back in so they could constantly do this analysis. We've come very far since then. But this is a fact barely mentioned. The first proton synchrotron was from Birmingham. And there's a blue plaque at the Pointing Physics Building, which loads of students pass every day. And that was where the very, very first one in the entire world was built. And nobody in the accelerator community talks about this. Nobody talks about the Birmingham synchrotron. But I only found out the other day, a bit of digging, it wasn't built in Birmingham. It was built in Malvern, which is in the middle of nowhere. I see the Malvern Hills from my room you know, every day growing up. And I never would have believed that the expertise in accelerators would move from this tiny little countryside town to Geneva, where that's where all the accelerators are and all the famous accelerators. So speaking of Geneva, this is the CERN complex. This is the series of tunnels underneath the French-Swiss border, where I have the privilege of living and working every single day. Now, each one of these lines that you see is a beam line, like the one I showed you of bending magnets and focusing magnets. And there's a lot to process here. It's, it's the CERN complex. It is pretty complex. Uh, but just to kind of briefly talk you through it, um, we start at the bottom with Linux 4. This makes our protons. They go into the booster, where it intensifies the beam by 4. It then goes to the proton synchrotron, which I like to consider as a very old, grumpy accelerator. It's from 1959. We didn't know how to build accelerators in 1959. It's really fiddly to operate. It then goes into the superproton synchrotron, where we once collided proton and antiprotons, antimatter collisions. Uh, and now we have the crown jewel of CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, and its four detectors around it. Now, this is quite a lot to absorb, so I thought I'd break it down a little bit into the, the, the whys, the fun bits. The proton synchrotron. It goes to the east area. This is where we do our electronics for space irradiation. So if we want to get our satellites into space, we need to know how our electronics fares under the intense radiation from the sun and from space. And so they come to us, NASA and ESA, and they go into our beamline, and they irradiate their components and see how they fare. And I'm very proud of this one because this is something one of the many projects I've worked on, and I improved the efficiency of this process by 20%, and it makes me happy. Uh, we have an electron beamline called CLEAR. I love, nobody ever talks about CLEAR, that's why I'm talking about CLEAR. It is one of the few beams in the world that can generate very high energy electrons for electron cancer treatment. And so we get medical physicists coming from uh, Canada and coming from the University in Lausanne to try this range of medical physics you can only do with this beamline, which some likes to forget. They never talk about this one. Um, I like this thing called Isolder. Isolder is great for nuclear research. They have basically any isotope you can think of, especially the rare ones. And they answered the question of, what shape is the nucleus? Nobody knows until they started to look at it. Turns out, most nucleuses aren't round. They're like a rugby ball. Or some of them are like a frisbee. It's called an oblate spheroid. Uh, and that's pretty fun. And they do a whole host of atomic wavelengths and genuinely very useful pure physics stuff that CERN doesn't talk about. Then we have the antimatter factory, which they're all my favorite, but this is my favorite. 
Uh, like, not many people can say that on their daily commute, they pass the only antimatter factory in the world. Um, what these guys do is they take antiprotons and they do such precise measurements. We understand antiprotons better than we understand protons, right? Because protons are boring, they're everywhere. Why would we measure those? But antiprotons, they're interesting. So we, we've done all these specific tests on them. Um, the superproton synchrotron, very famous for two force particles. These are called the W and the Z boson. They're OK. They're responsible for nuclear decays. That's cool. Uh, I like the north area a lot better. Uh, we're getting to the stage where it's hard to explain what it does. But they basically do more precision experiments with very strange particles, like kaons and pions and mesons, and exploring the particle zoo, basically. Um, and then we've got these four. So this is part of the Large Hadron Collider. CMS and ATLAS are general purpose detectors. That means they detect anything they want. These two are responsible for the Higgs boson discovery in 2012. Hooray. That was 10 years ago. What have they done since? I don't know. You guys definitely don't know. Um, LHCB is quite nice. It does studies with these particles called quarks. I'll explain them in a bit. ALICE is quite nice. They look at uh, what's called the strong force, what binds protons together. But, you know, at this stage, we're getting higher energies and we're getting a little bit more obscure. So why? Why is all this together? Why are these obscure things here? What these scientists are looking for is a quest for the model of everything. An equation, a magical thing that can explain the entire world. We want to know every elementary particle that forms our universe. What is our universe made of? And I'm going to show this diagram. This is a list of every fundamental particle. Um, now at the top, we have six flavors of quarks, so they're called. They're made of matter. Up and down quarks form protons, which is pretty cool. The electron, that's fundamental. Muon, it's heavier cousin. Um, pretty much everything else decays, to be honest, so they don't really matter so much. Um, these four are force particles. So they control the behavior between the matter particles over here. And then we realize these things are quite heavy. What are they made of? Why are they heavy? The Higgs which we discovered in 2012. The name gets thrown around a lot. What does it do? It gives particles mass. That is all it does. Every mass you have is as a result of the particles in your body interacting with this field called the Higgs field, which is everywhere. Um, well, um, Thomas said in his speech today, you know, when we landed on the moon, there was this sense of celebration. We landed on the moon. We did it. Well, now what? It's the same with the Higgs boson. We did it. We built this huge machine. We collided the particles. We found the Higgs boson. Well, now what? I don't know. They're doing their best. Uh, actually, no, that was, that was too scary. So, so the idea is we want a simple, a simple model of everything, something that explains the universe. This is simple, right? Let me, let me show you the equation behind all of this. It's this. It's this mess. You know, scientists want things to be beautiful mathematical descriptions of the universe. But the universe is what the universe wants to do. And apparently what the universe wants to do is this. I'm not going to try and explain it. I don't understand it myself. So what else comes out of CERN? Uh, I really liked that uh, Johan today, when he was talking about innovation, he mentioned three things. He mentioned. Uh, semiconductors, he mentioned the internet, and he mentioned umbrellas. Well, CERN has uh, had an impact on two of those three things, and it's not the umbrellas. The World Wide Web was invented at CERN in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee. We had so much data, we wanted a way to connect all the data between each other, so he came up with the idea of hyperlinks putting them into a structured system, and forming a web out of it. So we talked about the government coming up with the internet. Well, in a way, because CERN, governmentally funded organization, had the patent, the ownership of the World Wide Web. And they chose to put it in the public domain uh, a few short years later. And now we have 1.89 
billion websites on the World Wide Web. So it's a little bit more than just particles and Higgs bosons we're getting out of CERN, right? We're also getting the foundations of society. And CERN knows this, and they recognize this. So they have a knowledge transfer group, which is all about the patents and the technology that comes out of CERN. CERN has over 280 patents. Some of them are more practical, like polishing particular metals uh, or that one a few months ago was making a monoenergetic laser of one frequency from diamonds. Just, you just put the beam through the diamond and then the beam you get out is whatever frequency you want it to be. It's bizarre and very cheap. And so these monoenergetic lasers are going to be even better on the market. And they've made a startup company in the space of like two years after this discovery. So the certain knowledge transfer group is good. Uh, one of my favorites is the first ever 3D color x-ray scanner. Uh, so you can see here a picture of a wrist with a watch on it. Uh, so it's not just the 3D x-ray that is being patented, but the detector to detect uh, the particles coming off this is a semiconductor detector that CERN also came up with called Medipix, or sometimes Timepix. Um, so I could honestly give an entire talk about the CERN knowledge transfer, but they're not just accelerators, they're everything. So I thought I would go back to talking about accelerators. So this was the first slide I showed. For what purpose do we use accelerators? You guys know a little bit more about what accelerators are and why we built them in the first place. So for what purpose are they for now? Now I'm going to focus on three of these examples, because otherwise this talk would take way too long. Uh, if there's any of these three you want to hear about, but aren't those three, then make a mental note and ask me about it later. Uh, so if you've ever driven on the A34 towards Didcot, you may see this big old donut shaped building. Looks a little bit like GCHQ, but it's not GCHQ. Uh, what is it? It's a particle accelerator. So. Electrons, I mentioned before, when you accelerate them or when you bend them, produce light. And the light it produces depends on the energy of the beam. And so we have something called a synchrotron light source. They create beams of light brighter than the sun from x-rays at whatever frequency you want, from infrared to x-rays. There are over 50 of these in the world. Most of these are national facilities. But our one is called Diamond, and it is not a donut. It is actually a 48-sided shape. And at the end of each of these shapes is a beam line where they do whatever they want. So a lot of what they do is biology. So I mentioned protein mappings. You can see 3D structures of anything you put in the beam line by scattering light off it. They also do a lot of work in graphene to understand the structural properties of it. They do materials for renewables and solar panels. Uh, and they do a lot in looking at the materials and timelines of archaeological artifacts. For example, the uh, Mary Rose, the boat, has been analyzed by this beam. Uh, but in March 2020, pretty much most of this came to a halt. And they really focused on the coronavirus uh, vaccine. So when Johan said about how quick it was to produce this vaccine, it was so quick because we were able to image it pretty much immediately. I say here April 2020, it could have been March 2020, you know, when they were doing this work and just published it in April. So, and they continue to do a lot of coronavirus work in this beamline. Another example, to shrink tumors. Now, one third of all cancer treatments involve radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is the irradiation of the tumor. So what we do is we take our electrons, we accelerate them, and we hit them into a target. And that pro produces a spray of X-ray particles that we can focus and shape into the tumor. And this thing rotates. So it does a 360 degree around the patient to irradiate any angle of the tumor. 
And this is significant because this is our step towards bloodless surgery. The idea that we can treat anything in the human body without needing surgery, without needing to break anything. You know, not just treatment that's bloodless, but imaging as well. Seeing the body without having to break into it. Now, this technology has been commercialized. Thank goodness, it's everywhere. They're in ev most hospitals in the Western world. There are 11,000 Linux in the world. Um, I could talk a little bit about access to this technology, because that's a whole topic by itself. Um, but it's recommended to have seven accelerators per million population. And there are whole countries in the world which don't have any. So that is one part uh, of what my group looks at. But more than that, my main topic of research is shrinking tumors with particles, protons mostly. Because unlike x-rays, light travels through pretty much most of us. Particles penetrate in depth. And if you look at this graph, I promise it's the only graph I have. Uh, in blue, we have x-rays. Normal conventional radiotherapy is passing through the entire body. Uh, I say depth in water because humans are basically water density-wise. So we model humans as water always. Now, if you look at what our particles are doing, they have minimum dose in the entryway. If you imagine this surface is going to be our skin, for light, most of our energy, our dose, is going onto our skin. If we want depth to get to the rest of the tumor, then we use this peak of the particles. We call it a Bragg peak. And the more energetic the particle is, the deeper this Bragg peak goes. And this is great for irradiation of very sensitive regions. When you have head and neck tumors, you don't want to irradiate the entire thing because you're more likely to get secondary tumors in those areas. If you use this precise method, then you're more likely to reduce secondary tumors later on. So this is also used in pediatrics a lot. Uh, now, unfortunately, these machines are a lot larger. They're a lot more expensive, and there's a lot of research that needs to be done for different ions. Proton and carbon uh, have been clinically approved. Helium has not. Uh, a few other examples. For art, there is an accelerator in the basement of the Louvre. It's called ALGI. It's the Accelerateur Grand Louvre d'Analyse Elementaire. Pardon my French. And they use non-destructive techniques to understand what the art is made of. Now, the Knowledge Transfer Group is making a new transportable accelerator to send to art institutes because not every art institute is the Louvre. They can't afford their own accelerator. Uh, I can't resist this one. Muons from space have been used to find a hidden, a hidden chamber in the pyramids. We did this in 2016, non-destructive technique. We just placed some detectors around, and we saw there was a big old empty space. This technique is called muon tomography. It's also used in uh, a little bit of um, security purposes and also for nuclear uh, activation. So flourishing for whom? Uh, I've talked a little bit about these examples, but let's talk about government and industry a little bit. Now, CERN has some benefits and it has some disadvantages, but one of the ultimate benefits, I think, in having something like CERN, where you have members and the, the member states take taxpayer money and they give it to CERN and then they can, uh, they're allowed to partake in these exercises, CERN allows large-scale international infrastructure and collaborations. One country couldn't build the LHC, that's for sure. You need to have a collaboration. And CERN is really strict. Science for peace. No applications, no military, science for peace. And this was very important in post-war Europe. CERN started in 1954, and they had people of all nationalities working together in such a short time frame. Uh, they have successfully done the same in the Middle East. We have Sesame. This is a synchrotron light source, just like Diamond and it is, has been operational in Jordan since 2017. And it's an international collaboration between many countries of the Middle East. And this was started by a director general of CERN. We're trying to do the same in, uh, whoops, in Southeast Europe, in the Balkan region. This is part of the project I work on called CIST, and we want to do particle therapy, the cancer treatment machine over there. 
Uh, but all scientists at CERN are pretty much diplomats. They have functional immunity, including me. I've had to use mine twice. Ask me about it later. Um, but even I, I have mixed feelings about this. I feel like maybe scientists shouldn't have functional diplomacy, but it's helped me out. Uh, now, CERN is publicly funded, so our results are open. Everything's in journals, everything's in archive. Obviously, in journals, you have to question the growing inaccessibility of science. Ironically, you have to pay if you want to read that particular article. But more than that, CERN is its own economy. The money they get from their member states, it's not a black hole. <laughs> they don't absorb it. They give it back in forms of procurement. If their, their budget is 1.4 billion a year, and they give 500 million of it back to their member states for technologies that they want. Now, their method isn't very objective about it because they, they don't pick the best procurement from the best com companies to suit their interests. They have to equally give procurements to every country, every member, but we can't have everything. But there's a lot of bureaucracy. CERN used to be run by the top scientists who had experience, and now it's mostly run by United Nations alumni who do all of the you know, networking and the international work. And I, it's not going so great. The director general, she's the one who decides everything that happens. And I love Thomas's example where CERN kind of exists for its own existence because you have these careers and you need to keep these careers. But, CERN's mandate is limited to pure particle physics, not applied. And the resources concentrate on the Large Hadron Collider, basically. None of the other cool stuff that I showed you, those are all side effects. Which means medical physics is in huge need of support. We base, I'm not funded by CERN, I'm funded by EU Horizon 2020 medical application stuff. You know, CERN isn't giving money to medical physicists. And I loved that you can't bring about change with yesterday's technology as Thomas says, the next big accelerator is going to be used with 1970s technology, but bigger. What's the point? It's less efficient, it's less creative, and it's less useful, as Thomas says. And the public can't decide on what this money's being used for. People, they love to say, ah, oh, well, the taxpayer's money, it's only one cup of coffee a year. Well, that cup of coffee a year isn't going for fundamental science, it's for footing the electricity bill, which is extortionate, by the way. And it's used to power the LHC, and it's salaries for old permanent staff that are trying to find these beautiful equations that don't explain the universe. So going back to curiosity-driven research, Rand says that governmental scientific inquiry is a contradiction in terms. And I still want to find out how can we fund curiosity I have some funky ideas about accelerators, but I wouldn't know they don't have any obvious profit drive yet. In the future, maybe. So what are the limitations in taking this curiosity to industry? I mentioned at the start there are 35,000 accelerators in the world. Only 0.5% of these are for physics research. Uh, most of it is, as I mentioned, the medical applications, including x-rays. But a lot of it is for industry. 34% make sem all semiconductors. 16% are for wielding. I kind of feel like that's making a really complicated thing and you're then using it as a hammer. <laughs> I'd like to have more creative options. So this is how the market looks at the moment uh, for new technologies, developing technologies. And the overwhelming challenge is, well, we want them to fit into hospitals. We want them to be reduced in cost and size. We want them to be reduced in cost and size. We want them to be portable. We want them to be portable. What do we need to do next? We want small, cheap proton accelerators. And I don't know anyone who's working on that. Now, we have these two methods to create new technologies. We have incremental. Uh, part of what my group is also doing, they made the first ever 3D printed uh, accelerator component. It looks like this. It's beautiful. I love it. But it only works for specific frequencies. And we need more of them. Uh, using superconductors in ways they haven't been used before to make things smaller, more powerful. That's expensive. You know, they're small, but it's not cheap. Disruptive technologies are looking a lot more interesting, but there, there aren't very many of them around. Laser-driven accelerator, I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, dielectric acceleration, they're doing it in America. It's only for electrons. I'd love to help out with that. It's very niche. But role of individual. Now that I've said everything, 
uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I do. I'm designing future particle therapy facilities for treatment, but also for research. Uh, so this is a laser-driven approach. A beam, 90 degrees to some foil. You get a whole sheaf of particles coming out, but they're really messy. You need to capture them. So uh, that's what Lara is. My name, my logo, this little bit of the beam line I started with, and now I'm doing this part of the beam line. Uh, it's big old work. Um, next, I'm focusing on a helium synchrotron. My PhD is on extraction technologies. My job is to create pretty GIFs that look like this, uh, which control how beams go to the patient. That's the most important bit. It doesn't matter if you accelerate the beam. If it's not going to the patient, it's not doing anything. So I do extraction. But next, I want to work on muon sources because they're cool as hell. And I want to use proton compact uh, technology. And also, I do a little bit <laughs> of operation. Um, so I do my fair share of night shifts. This is me in Heidelberg uh, controlling the proton hadron therapy machine. This is me in the main CERN control room. It's a fun time. It's crazy. I'd like to finish with another quote. Maybe now that you've listened to all of this, you can make the connections. This is the start of Atlas Shrugged when the Taggart comet pulls into the terminal. And Dagny says, she watched the tunnels as they flowed past. Bare walls of concrete, a net of pipes and wires, webs of rail that went off into black holes. There was nothing else. So one could admire the naked purpose and ingenuity that had achieved it. Thank you very much.